Hey everybody. Oh, squeaky voice. Hello everybody. Camera's on, time to start. Good to see you all. If you've all started turning your cameras on. Great, okay. Hi Chong. Hi teacher. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Oh, good. And have you done anything in particular since we saw each other last? Um, no. No? Just a normal week. Okay, well, that's always good, isn't it? <laughs> Hi, Carlson. Hi, teacher. How are you? I'm well. Oh, good. And uh, same question. Have you done anything in particular since last week? Anything worth mentioning? Um, no, just like you do. Just, just your usual week, that's good. All right. Hi, Danny Asri. Hi, teacher. How are you? Hi, teacher. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, can hear you now. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. All good. You weren't here last week, were you? Yeah. Oh, I um, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I was preparing for my examination, so that's why. Oh, okay, and how did they go? Um, they, they went well. <laughs> oh, good. That's good then. So, Danny Asri, we did actually, we did a test as well, so you will need to catch up with that, but we'll talk about it today so that you know what you have to do, okay, that you might need to put some more time in after the lesson as well, because obviously uh, you've missed that time now, but good to see you again. Hi, Lynn. Hi, teacher. Teacher, I'm sorry that uh, my camera was not functioning well, so I'm not able to switch on. Okay. Um, no problem. Let's hope, hope it will work again next time. Good, good to hear from you, though. Um, same question. Have you done anything in particular since last week? Yeah, uh, me and my friend went to a small uh, short trip to KL, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. <clears throat> uh, to a where, sorry? Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. In oh Malaysia. wow! Yeah. Oh, they're very nice. Yeah, great. That's very nice. Uh, is that far from where you are? Uh, about three hundred something ki uh, kilometer. Wow. Okay. Great. Um, how did you get there? Uh, we went there by car. Mm. Um, and what in particular did you do there? Uh, we went to we went to eat some food. Something oh, nice. Food. Yeah. Is it, what food is famous in that area? Uh, the seafood, yeah. Mmm, seafood, love seafood. Certain types of seafood, actually. There's some that I don't like. Like, I'm not too keen on octopus, but uh, other seafoods, very tasty. Yeah. Very nice. Mm -hmm. What's your favourite seafood? Um, I think most of the seafood are my favourites. Yes. Really? Oh, is, it, yeah. is it your thing? Your thing? Oh, nice. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad you had a good time. That's nice. And lots of nice food. That's always the nice thing about going away, isn't it? Tend to have lots of different foods to try. Um, hi, Jeshria. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. All good. And uh, have you done anything exciting this week? Uh, not that exciting, but I finished my examinations, which is really, uh, uh, I'm so relieved. Oh, yes, good. And do you think they went okay? No. Oh, do, oh no. What, what made you think that? Um, because some um the papers were a little hard for me. Oh, okay. You never know. I think, like I said to somebody last week, you never know. It might have been better than you thought. You might actually do better than you thought um, you, you're going to. Hopefully, fingers crossed. How long do you have to wait until you find out? Um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. If they mm -hmm. mark the papers, if they are finished marking, then we might get our results back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, fingers crossed. Um, you can get them back quickly. Cause it's, it's horrible waiting as well, isn't it? You're not knowing how you've got on. <laughs> Um, so I hope you get those back quickly. Okay, uh, great. I think somebody else just came in. Was it Eugene? Has he just come in? Maybe he's in the waiting room. Ah, he's here. Hello, Eugene. Hello. 
How are you? Um, I'm well. Oh, good. And uh, have you done anything exciting this week? Uh, nothing. I just um, doing revision and homework. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, all important, important stuff, isn't it? Um, so well done for sticking to that and being dedicated as always. Well done. So good to see you all. Um, some people are not here, so uh, hopefully they will join us, but we'll get started. So um, as you probably know already, we're going to be carrying on with the mock tests that we started last week. And last week you did the reading section. This week, as, uh, and most of you have done the speaking test as well now. We came, you came to the breakout rooms with me and um, did the speaking test. This week we're going to do the listening test. If you haven't done the speaking test, you'll do that. So I think it's just you, Danny Asri, isn't it? Anybody else not done the speaking? Has anybody else not done it? Okay. Um, it's better to be in a pair, Danny Asri. So I'll think about whether, I mean, we have to be so you can do a discussion. I might pull somebody else in to do the speaking test again because um, I think everybody else has done it. But um, we'll see how we get on. We might have to leave it, but we'll, I'll, I'll think about that one. And then if we have any time left at the end, We'll have a look at the writing together um, and, and give you some time for that. I haven't received, has anybody sent their writing already? I know I sent, I sent you the overview last week. Unmute and tell me if you have already sent your writing back. No, okay, so if we get time, we'll start it and then you'll definitely have to complete it and send it by email for homework, like I mentioned last week, but I did give you two weeks, so that's fine if you haven't done it yet. Sorry, dry mouth. Okay, so uh, just to remind you about the structure of the test. So we get an hour and 15 minutes for the reading and the use of English. That's what we did last week. Writing should take about an hour and 20 minutes. There's two sections. So um, about an hour and ten, uh, so about, about 40 minutes for, for each one. And then Listening, which we're doing today, will take roughly 40 minutes. We're really, it's just the length of the audio that we're listening to. Um, so it consists of four parts. Each part contains a recorded text or text and some questions, including multiple choice, sentence completion, and multiple matching questions. Each text is heard twice, and there is a total of 30 questions. So that's what we're going to do in a minute. Speaking, I'll talk you through it if we do it in a breakout room. But otherwise, you've been through that anyway. So just some general, um, actually, we'll do the feedback right at the end, I think, actually. So, uh, OK, let's get started with the listening then. So I'm going to give you the link like we did last week. And it will bring up this form. So you all need to put in your names and then you need to wait because obviously you can't do any of it until you hear the text, uh, until you hear the audio, sorry. So just, just get your form ready. Again, like we said last week, when you do it for real, it will just be a, a question paper rather than the Google Forms. But it's similar, isn't it? So I'm sure you'll be fine with that. So we'll listen to the whole thing. And then as you listen, you can be working your way through the questions, selecting the options. It will give you the instructions for each question. And then we'll get all the way down to the bottom 40 minutes later and you can submit once you're happy. OK, are there any questions before we start? Well, good luck. I will start the audio and we will get started. Cambridge English. First certificate in English for schools, listening. Okay, could you all hear that okay? Okay, any problems, just unmute and let me know. Sample test two. I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you'll hear this sound. 
you'll hear each piece twice. Remember, while you're listening, write your answers on the question paper. You'll have five minutes at the end of the test to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. There will now be a pause. Please ask any questions now because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer, A, B or C. Question one. You hear an art teacher talking about learning to draw cartoons. So many young people sign up for my lessons to learn the art of drawing cartoons. Regardless of experience, everyone finds their drawing technique improves in record time with my simple step-by-step -step drawing lessons. Whether it's your first time learning how to draw, or whether you've got plenty of experience, you'll appreciate my method because I make it seem so straightforward. It's true. You can learn to draw cartoons without stress, though, like anything in life, it's up to you if you want to take it further. Be ready to practice on your own. You'll find drawing cartoons is one of the most satisfying things you can learn to do. So many young people sign up for my lessons to learn the art of drawing cartoons. Regardless of experience, everyone finds their drawing technique improves in record time with my simple step-by-step -step drawing lessons. Whether it's your first time learning how to draw, or whether you've got plenty of experience, You'll appreciate my method because I make it seem so straightforward. It's true. You can learn to draw cartoons without stress. Though, like anything in life, it's up to you if you want to take it further. Be ready to practice on your own. You'll find drawing cartoons is one of the most satisfying things you can learn to do. Question 2. You hear a boy talking to a friend about butterflies. Our class is doing a butterfly survey. We're supposed to find out about them, learn their names and write down when we see them. Wow, sounds quite interesting. Yeah, there are loads around in summer with all the flowers out. Not just in the countryside, but even in the middle of town they aren't hard to find. I've managed to learn what most of them are called. Some of the names in the book sound quite strange. But the tricky bit's relating the name to the new one that's in front of you before it flies away. You know, matching up the colours and patterns with the picture in the book. Our class is doing a butterfly survey. We're supposed to find out about them, learn their names and write down when we see them. Wow, sounds quite interesting. Yeah, there are loads around in summer with all the flowers out. Not just in the countryside, but even in the middle of town they aren't hard to find. I've managed to learn what most of them are called. Some of the names in the book sound quite strange, but the tricky bit's relating the name to the new one that's in front of you before it flies away. You know, matching up the colours and patterns with the picture in the book. Question 3. You hear a boy talking about a long walk he did to raise money for charity. I had a really exhausting weekend. Went on a 10-kilometre charity walk. At least the sun was shining this time, unlike last year when it absolutely poured down, apparently. That would have been really nasty. We stopped for lunch on the way, so there was no rush. My feet still hurt a bit when I'd finished, but it was worth it. Then someone from the local newspaper came to ask me loads of questions, but I would have preferred not to have been the one in the spotlight. I guess I'll get my picture published soon. I'd quite happily have given that bit a miss, though, to be honest. I had a really exhausting weekend. Went on a 10-kilometre charity walk. 
At least the sun was shining this time, unlike last year when it absolutely poured down, apparently. That would have been really nasty. We stopped for lunch on the way, so there was no rush. My feet still hurt a bit when I'd finished, but it was worth it. Then someone from the local newspaper came to ask me loads of questions, but I would have preferred not to have been the one in the spotlight. I guess I'll get my picture published soon. I'd quite happily have given that bit a miss, though, to be honest. Question 4. You hear a teacher talking to her class. When you're meeting your friends and want to tell them about something you've experienced, I'm sure you'd tell them all about it in your own words, and you certainly wouldn't need to do any research. So, for this class presentation, I'd say, just pick the subject that you know most about. That way, for homework, you won't have to do very much, or even any background reading. You'll be surprised at how much information you have stored in your memory. All you really need to do is make an outline to make sure you cover all the details, then practice what you're going to say, using that as your guide. When you're meeting your friends and want to tell them about something you've experienced, I'm sure you'd tell them all about it in your own words, and you certainly wouldn't need to do any research. So, for this class presentation, I'd say, just pick the subject that you know most about. That way, for homework, you won't have to do very much, or even any background reading. You'll be surprised at how much information you have stored in your memory. All you really need to do is make an outline to make sure you cover all the details, then practice what you're going to say, using that as your guide. Question 5. You hear two friends talking about a competition. So, Jason, will you have a go at the competition for young computer games designers, then? It'd be really cool if I could, but I don't know if I'm really up to it. But it's for 11 to 16-year-olds, so it should be your sort of thing, don't you think? It's more a question of whether I've got what it takes, really. But you know a massive amount about computer games. From the point of view of a player, yeah, absolutely. But as a designer, that's a different thing, really. I'll definitely have a closer look at the competition rules, though. I've printed them off, actually. So, Jason, will you have a go at the competition for young computer games designers, then? It'd be really cool if I could, but I don't know if I'm really up to it. But it's for 11 to 16-year-olds, so it should be your sort of thing, don't you think? It's more a question of whether I've got what it takes, really. But you know a massive amount about computer games. From the point of view of a player, yeah, absolutely. But as a designer, that's a different thing, really. I'll definitely have a closer look at the competition rules, though. I've printed them off, actually. Question 6. You hear a teacher talking about writing a poem. In order to write a poem of your own for the school magazine, you need to prepare yourself. I'd like your views on what might help you. It might be taking it in turns to read a classic poem in front of the class each day before we start, or it could be looking at what's out there on the internet. I suggest initially everyone choosing something from this collection here. The stuff's all by people your own age, which should help you find the freedom to explore what's important to you. Your poem should try and capture life as it happens, without worrying about what others will say. In order to write a poem of your own for the school magazine, you need to prepare yourself. I'd like your views on what might help you. It might be taking it in turns to read a classic poem in front of the class each day before we start, or it could be looking at what's out there on the internet. I suggest initially everyone choosing something from this collection here. The stuff's all by people your own age, which should help you find the freedom to explore what's important to you. 
Your poem should try and capture life as it happens, without worrying about what others will say. Question 7. You hear two friends talking about a book about a footballer. Did you like that book I lent you? I thought the footballer's life story was inspirational. Really? I thought I knew everything about him from seeing him on TV. I had no idea he'd had such a tough childhood. Me neither. And he's really written from the heart. He's so honest about everything. It's certainly a good read, but I don't think he wrote it himself. He'll have paid somebody else to do it. Do you think so? Oh, what a letdown. I really felt like he was talking to me personally. Well, I'm sure the writer would have interviewed him, so it should be what he actually said. Yes, must be. Did you like that book I lent you? I thought the footballer's life story was inspirational. Really? I thought I knew everything about him from seeing him on TV. I had no idea he'd had such a tough childhood. Me neither. And he's really written from the heart. He's so honest about everything. It's certainly a good read, but I don't think he wrote it himself. He'll have paid somebody else to do it. Do you think so? Oh, what a letdown. I really felt like he was talking to me personally. Well, I'm sure the writer would have interviewed him, so it should be what he actually said. Yes, must be. Question 8. You hear part of a programme on the subject of animals. Chester Zoo is celebrating the arrival of a very special creature, a rare onager foal. The male baby, who hasn't yet been named, was born to first-time mum, Zarin, last week. Onagers are related to the domestic donkey and are an Asiatic wild ass from semi-desert regions in the Middle East. These creatures are now found in just two protected areas and there are thought to be only about 400 left in existence. Chester Zoo reports that the foal is doing well. Check the zoo's website to keep up to date with how the zoo's coping with the problems of dealing with the newborn and to learn what name has been chosen for him. Chester Zoo is celebrating the arrival of a very special creature, a rare onager foal. The male baby, who hasn't yet been named, was born to first-time mum, Zarin, last week. Onagers are related to the domestic donkey and are an Asiatic wild ass from semi-desert regions in the Middle East. These creatures are now found in just two protected areas and there are thought to be only about 400 left in existence. Chester Zoo reports that the foal is doing well. Check the zoo's website to keep up to date with how the zoo's coping with the problems of dealing with the newborn and to learn what name has been chosen for him. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a young man called Sam Conti telling a group of students about his job as a specialist chocolate maker. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part two. Hi, my name's Sam Conti, and my job is making and selling chocolate. Later on, I'm going to show you some of my chocolate. You might even get a chance to try some. But first, a bit about me. People often ask how I got into this business. Well, my parents wanted me to have a steady job, and they suggested studying something like medicine at university, because they thought a job in that area would pay well, or even economics. But at the time, I thought law might open more doors, so that's what I did. But life doesn't always work out the way you plan it. After finishing my degree, I took time out and went traveling in South America, where I ended up staying over a year on a cocoa plantation. I discovered that growing high-quality cocoa beans is a process that's not at all straightforward. In fact, it's a very complex one. So there's far more to the making of chocolate than first meets the eye. 
I had no idea, for example, how easily the cocoa beans are affected by changes in weather and climate, much more than other fruit like apples or bananas. In fact, the beans are more like grapes, really. So each year's crop is of a different quality. When I came home, I decided to open a small shop making and selling my own chocolate. That was hard work, I can tell you, because so much can go wrong with chocolate. The hardest bit is melting it in precisely the right way. But cooling it correctly isn't easy either. To learn the trade, I set about testing all the chocolate I could find. The first thing I do is break off a piece. I want to hear the snap. If it makes that noise, it means it's good. Then I smell it just before popping it into my mouth. I'll never forget the first chocolates I sold in the shop. I got such a buzz from it, and I've never lost that thrill. Another thing I like to do is write up my experiments. I keep a diary for this. It's the key to my success. One day I'll put it all on a database, but I haven't had time yet. I make a range of chocolates, but what I'm aiming for is a rich and rounded flavor without bitterness. I want top quality, but there must be a richness and only a limited sweetness. And, of course, a completely new recipe so that I can be setting a new trend. That takes time. And trying out new ideas means tasting a lot. To counter the calories, I go swimming and do a lot of running. But even then, chocolates aren't far from my mind. I actually come up with most of my strangest recipes when I'm driving. Once I've got an idea, I pick up samples and ingredients and do the cooking myself. I keep playing with flavors until I feel it's ready to try on friends. These sessions have produced some fantastic ideas, such as chili-flavored chocolate, which was much more successful than anyone imagined. But I've also had my fair share of disasters, like chocolate flavored with cheese, which nobody bought. I test recipes out on my family, and they're never shy about telling me what they really think. Anyway, I've got some chocolate here for you to try. But before we do that, I'd like to show you a short video clip that shows me actually making the stuff in my laboratory. Yes, that's the name I use for the place where I work because it is quite scientific what I do. But it's a workshop, really, and it's located in what used to be an old sweet factory next to my house. Here it is, coming up on the screen now. Now you'll hear part two again. Hi, my name's Sam Conti, and my job is making and selling chocolate. Later on, I'm going to show you some of my chocolate, you might even get a chance to try some. But first, a bit about me. People often ask how I got into this business. Well, my parents wanted me to have a steady job, and they suggested studying something like medicine at university because they thought a job in that area would pay well, or even economics. But at the time, I thought law might open more doors, so that's what I did. But life doesn't always work out the way you plan it. After finishing my degree, I took time out and went traveling in South America, where I ended up staying over a year on a cocoa plantation. I discovered that growing high-quality cocoa beans is a process that's not at all straightforward. In fact, it's a very complex one. So there's far more to the making of chocolate than first meets the eye. I had no idea, for example, how easily the cocoa beans are affected by changes in weather and climate, much more than other fruit like apples or bananas. In fact, the beans are more like grapes, really, so each year's crop is of a different quality. When I came home, I decided to open a small shop making and selling my own chocolate. That was hard work, I can tell you, because so much can go wrong with chocolate. The hardest bit is melting it in precisely the right way. But cooling it correctly isn't easy either. To learn the trade, I set about testing all the chocolate I could find. The first thing I do is break off a piece. I want to hear the snap. If it makes that noise, it means it's good. 
Then I smell it just before popping it into my mouth. I'll never forget the first chocolates I sold in the shop. I got such a buzz from it, and I've never lost that thrill. Another thing I like to do is write up my experiments. I keep a diary for this. It's the key to my success. One day I'll put it all on a database, but I haven't had time yet. I make a range of chocolates, but what I'm aiming for is a rich and rounded flavor without bitterness. I want top quality, but there must be a richness and only a limited sweetness. And, of course, a completely new recipe so that I can be setting a new trend. That takes time. And trying out new ideas means tasting a lot. To counter the calories, I go swimming and do a lot of running. But even then, chocolates aren't far from my mind. I actually come up with most of my strangest recipes when I'm driving. Once I've got an idea, I pick up samples and ingredients and do the cooking myself. I keep playing with flavors until I feel it's ready to try on friends. These sessions have produced some fantastic ideas, such as chili-flavored chocolate, which was much more successful than anyone imagined. But I've also had my fair share of disasters, like chocolate flavored with cheese, which nobody bought. I test recipes out on my family, and they're never shy about telling me what they really think. Anyway, I've got some chocolate here for you to try. But before we do that, I'd like to show you a short video clip that shows me actually making the stuff in my laboratory. Yes, that's the name I use for the place where I work. Because it is quite scientific what I do. But it's a workshop, really. And it's located in what used to be an old sweet factory next to my house. Here it is, coming up on the screen now. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five short extracts in which teenagers are talking about their hobbies. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to H what each speaker likes most about their hobby. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker one. I have a hobby which is super fun and superbly unique. Unicycling, you know, a one-wheel bike, isn't as easy as it looks, but you can learn how to do it. You can either try learning it from someone who already knows how to do it, which is what I did at first, or take a course. What makes unicycling so cool is that you can make up your own tricks on it, like hopping and jumping. Now I go to classes every week to make sure I learn new moves and perfect them by going over them again and again. Sometimes I take part in unicycling competitions too. They're good fun. Speaker 2 now everyone reckons that learning how to dance is a very interesting hobby, but at first I wasn't so sure. Dancing can be really fun to do as well as to watch, and so it's good for everyone. Mind you, some types of dancing can be quite challenging and difficult and require a lot of dedication and precision. That's why I love my street dance classes. They're really aimed at people like me who don't want to study every type of dance, but who just like to enjoy themselves. And you make friends too. Maybe one day I'll be good enough to enter a dance competition, but I'm not counting on it. Speaker 3 My dad's hobby is photography, and he's passed this on to me. He says every hobby's got a practical and technical side, and I mostly agree. My view is that photography is actually an art, much more than just pointing a camera and taking a photo. I think learning about photography is a great hobby for me because we have an opportunity to put our photos in competitions too, and that's what makes it really worthwhile. I know it isn't as challenging as it used to be because now there are digital cameras and you can change things on your computer, but it's still really exciting. 
speak of four. A singing's an art, and learning how to sing can be a good hobby. There are many ways to enjoy this hobby, whether you practice on your own, join a choir, or just use a karaoke machine with your friends. I get a real buzz from seeing the look on their faces when it's my turn to sing. I'm not creative enough to write my own songs, but I do make sure that I pick the best ones available because it does make a difference. Sometimes I have singing classes and my teacher says I should go in for competitions, but I'm not sure how my friends would react to that idea. Speaker 5 You'll be surprised, but I would say cooking's become a real cool hobby for me and my friends these days. With all the new kinds of innovations coming in the cooking field, more and more people are getting interested in cooking delicious food for themselves, as well as their family. I even liked the idea of becoming a chef once. Now I go to cookery classes where we compete with each other to see who can prepare the best meal. I do find some recipes demanding, but that's the fun of it for me, like baking cupcakes. If I keep trying again and again, I'll get better and better. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker 1 I have a hobby which is super fun and superbly unique. Unicycling, you know, a one-wheel bike, isn't as easy as it looks, but you can learn how to do it. You can either try learning it from someone who already knows how to do it, which is what I did at first, or take a course. What makes unicycling so cool is that you can make up your own tricks on it, like hopping and jumping. Now I go to classes every week to make sure I learn new moves, and perfect them by going over them again and again. Sometimes I take part in unicycling competitions too. They're good fun. Speaker 2 Now everyone reckons that learning how to dance is a very interesting hobby. But at first I wasn't so sure. Dancing can be really fun to do as well as to watch. And so it's good for everyone. Mind you, some types of dancing can be quite challenging and difficult and require a lot of dedication and precision. That's why I love my street dance classes. They're really aimed at people like me who don't want to study every type of dance, but who just like to enjoy themselves. And you make friends too. Maybe one day I'll be good enough to enter a dance competition, but I'm not counting on it. Speaker 3 My dad's hobby is photography, and he's passed this on to me. He says every hobby's got a practical and technical side, and I mostly agree. My view is that photography is actually an art, much more than just pointing a camera and taking a photo. I think learning about photography is a great hobby for me because we have an opportunity to put our photos in competitions too, and that's what makes it really worthwhile. I know it isn't as challenging as it used to be because now there are digital cameras and you can change things on your computer. But it's still really exciting. Speaker 4 A singing's an art, and learning how to sing can be a good hobby. There are many ways to enjoy this hobby, whether you practice on your own, join a choir, or just use a karaoke machine with your friends. I get a real buzz from seeing the look on their faces when it's my turn to sing. I'm not creative enough to write my own songs, but I do make sure that I pick the best ones available because it does make a difference. Sometimes I have singing classes and my teacher says I should go in for competitions, but I'm not sure how my friends would react to that idea. Speaker 5 You'll be surprised, but I would say cooking's become a real cool hobby for me and my friends these days. With all the new kinds of innovations coming in the cooking field, more and more people are getting interested in cooking delicious food for themselves, as well as their family. I even liked the idea of becoming a chef once. Now I go to cookery classes where we compete with each other to see who can prepare the best meal. I do find some recipes demanding, but that's the fun of it for me, like baking cupcakes. If I keep trying again and again, I'll get better and better. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four.
You'll hear part of an interview with a successful young swimmer called Helen Gibson. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. My guest today is champion swimmer Helen Gibson. Helen, welcome. Was swimming always your sport as a kid? Well, I come from a pretty sporty family, actually, and both my older brothers were strong swimmers, which put me off a bit at first because I never stood a chance of beating them. So I actually took up running. That was my dad's sport and was something I could share with him. He'd take me running along by these canals. I was always a bit frightened of falling in, so he and Mum convinced me to have some swimming coaching to build up my confidence in the water. And of course, it wasn't long before I gave up the running altogether. <laughs> so why did the swimming go so well? People at the club I joined said I was a natural swimmer, but I didn't believe them till I started winning regional championships, then national. Then I was like, wow, I can do this. I'm pretty focused generally. Things aren't worth doing if you're not passionate about them. Not everybody has that drive. It's a tough sport though, and ultimately it was down to me. And of course I was fortunate to have all the facilities I needed nearby. So what was your training schedule like in those early years? Very intensive, really. Every spare moment when I wasn't at school or doing homework was given over to training. Though I never got behind with the studies, actually. Fortunately, I had some amazing coaches who planned fun workouts. It's more productive that way, and I'm grateful to them for that. At the beginning, I took time out to hang out with friends, but as I got more successful, my routine ruled that out. But I was cool with that because swimming had become my life. How do you feel before a big race? It's what I've trained for, so I try to keep calm, get ready in good time. I go and stand by the pool a couple of events before my race with my hood up and my headphones on. Music keeps me grounded. I always do the same series of stretches because they suit my body, but I don't think about the other swimmers in the event because I can't influence what they do. It's all about my own ability. So now you've turned professional, what's that like? I love being fit and challenging myself as an athlete. Now I've left school, I can concentrate on that 100%. Of course, being in the public eye has its downsides, like reading stuff about yourself that's untrue. I can laugh it off, but some athletes find it hard to deal with. I do get to travel, some people would love that, but actually living out of a suitcase isn't my idea of a good time. <laughs> so what's the hardest thing to deal with? Getting injured isn't fun for anyone. I've been fortunate in avoiding anything too serious, but I get the usual aches and pains. You feel miserable, but you have to stay strong. Not getting results is also tough. I talk regularly with my sports psychologist if things aren't going well, so that I don't start feeling negative about things. But there's nothing worse than competing in front of a home crowd. Their expectations are so high. Once I got really stressed out just thinking who was watching. Hmm. Any advice for kids listening who'd like to follow in your footsteps? If I say, if you keep trying, kids, you can be like me, that sounds great, doesn't it? But it can't be true for everybody. I've matured a lot recently and see things more clearly. I've given up any idea of going to college and pursuing another career for the moment, but that's my decision. I'm not saying it's the only way. In fact, what I would say is... It's important to learn from your own successes and failures because only you know what you're really capable of. Now you'll hear part four again. My guest today is champion swimmer Helen Gibson. Helen, welcome. Was swimming always your sport as a kid? Well, I come from a pretty sporty family, actually, and both my older brothers were strong swimmers, which put me off a bit at first because I never stood a chance of beating them. So I actually took up running. That was my dad's sport and was something I could share with him. He'd take me running along by these canals. I was always a bit frightened of falling in, so he and Mum convinced me to have some swimming coaching to build up my confidence in the water. And of course, it wasn't long before I gave up the running altogether. <laughs> so why did the swimming go so well? People at the club I joined said I was a natural swimmer, but I didn't believe them till I started winning regional championships, then national. Then I was like, wow, I can do this. 
I'm pretty focused generally. Things aren't worth doing if you're not passionate about them. Not everybody has that drive. It's a tough sport though, and ultimately it was down to me. And of course I was fortunate to have all the facilities I needed nearby. So what was your training schedule like in those early years? Very intensive, really. Every spare moment when I wasn't at school or doing homework was given over to training, though I never got behind with the studies, actually. Fortunately, I had some amazing coaches who planned fun workouts. It's more productive that way, and I'm grateful to them for that. At the beginning, I took time out to hang out with friends, but as I got more successful, my routine ruled that out. But I was cool with that because swimming had become my life. How do you feel before a big race? It's what I've trained for, so I try to keep calm, get ready in good time. I go and stand by the pool a couple of events before my race with my hood up and my headphones on. Music keeps me grounded. I always do the same series of stretches because they suit my body, but I don't think about the other swimmers in the event because I can't influence what they do. It's all about my own ability. So now you've turned professional, what's that like? I love being fit and challenging myself as an athlete. Now I've left school, I can concentrate on that 100%. Of course, being in the public eye has its downsides, like reading stuff about yourself that's untrue. I can laugh it off, but some athletes find it hard to deal with. I do get to travel, some people would love that, but actually living out of a suitcase isn't my idea of a good time. <laughs> so what's the hardest thing to deal with? Getting injured isn't fun for anyone. I've been fortunate in avoiding anything too serious, but I get the usual aches and pains. You feel miserable, but you have to stay strong. Not getting results is also tough. I talk regularly with my sports psychologists if things aren't going well, so that I don't start feeling negative about things. But there's nothing worse than competing in front of a home crowd. Their expectations are so high. Once I got really stressed out just thinking who was watching. Hmm. Any advice for kids listening who'd like to follow in your footsteps? If I say, if you keep trying, kids, you can be like me, that sounds great, doesn't it? But it can't be true for everybody. I've matured a lot recently and see things more clearly. I've given up any idea of going to college and pursuing another career for the moment, but that's my decision. I'm not saying it's the only way. In fact, what I would say is... It's important to learn from your own successes and failures because only you know what you're really capable of. That's the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left so that you're sure to finish in time. So we don't need to do that bit. Uh, that bit, you, it's just so that you don't have to go between two papers when you're doing the listening, because it can get confusing. So you'll put your answers on the questions when you're doing it for real, you'll put the answers on the question sheet um, while you're listening, and then you just have to transfer it all over to one page of answers. So that it'll all be quite straightforward. You just need to copy really carefully. Other all of, otherwise, all of your good listening will go to waste. So, does anybody have any questions about that, that section? Everybody think you've done okay? Yep, yeah, okay, so click submit. And I will see your results. I shall look forward to those. All right, so once you're happy, click submit. And then I think we'll take our break now. Um, and then we will... Um, sorry, just thinking whether to do a speaking thing. Uh, yeah, we'll take the break now. And then when we come back, we can get started with our writing assignment. And then you'll have done quite a lot of it. Um, and you then we'll be able to finish it for homework. Okay, so we'll take 15 minutes. Any questions before we go? No, nope. okay, great. Have a good break. Well done for working so hard on that listening. Very good. Great, okay, so hopefully you're all feeling nice and refreshed after that break. Um, camera's back on again then, please. Okay, very good. Okay, great, great job so far. I've done really well with the 
uh, reading last week, the listening this week, and now we're going to get started with the writing. So as you'll remember, we've got um, an hour and 20 minutes to do the writing. It consists of two parts and they carry equal marks. So therefore, I suggest you split that hour and 20 minutes equally. So part one is um, compulsory. You don't get to choose whether to do it or not. You have to write an essay of between 140 and 190 words, giving your opinion. Um, and in part two, there are three tasks from which can, can, uh, candidates choose one task uh, to write about. So you get to choose which one you feel most comfortable to write about. So this is the one for this mock test uh, that we're going to have a look at now. And don't forget, you're going to be returning it to this email address. So if you haven't already made a note of this email address, write it down now. I'll write it in the chat box as well, copy it into the chat box, because when you have finished, that's where you're going to send it. But remember, you shouldn't be taking any longer than an hour and 20 minutes. So you are going to have to spend a bit of time after the lesson, finishing it off as well, um, but just time yourself. So this is part one. And uh, Danny Astri, can you read that out for everybody, please? You must answer this question, write your answer in 140 to 190 words in an appropriate style on the separate answer sheet. In your English class, you have been talking about the fashion industry. Now your English teacher has asked you to write an essay. Write an essay using all the notes and giving reasons for your point of view. Good. And then here are the notes. It says, some people say the fashion industry has a bad effect on people's lives. Do you agree? So notes um, are that you could write about whether people's appearance is important the price of clothes plus an idea of your own or more than one idea of your own then for part two you're going to choose which one you do and again you're going to write 140 to 190 words so you can use the, obviously the word count on um, word uh, or whatever you're writing in and you're going to choose whether you do a report, an article, or a review, and it gives you more information in there. So you can do it on a Word document, make sure you keep saving it and then send it, or if there's a different format that you usually use, a different program, Google Docs, or uh, something else that you usually type on, that's fine, as long as you can attach it to an email and send it to me that way. Okay, so, you should all be starting with this one about the fashion industry. So it's an essay about the fashion industry. Think about how you might want to structure that. You can start by writing some ideas and notes of your own as well so that you, you add to these ones. Um, are there any questions before we start? Okay, so open a Word document or Google Docs and you can get started. I'll send it to you as well so that when you continue, I know I sent it last week, but I'll send it again. And then when you continue, you have got it there ready. Ready to look at and continue working. So it's in the chat box as well, the actual writing section of the test. If you've got any questions, you can just unmute. And I'll leave that on there. Sure, can I write in Word? Yeah, that's fine. Did you say teacher or sir? <laughs> I uh, say teacher. Oh, okay. Yeah, in Word, that's fine. It's probably the easiest way if you write it in Word. If, uh, make sure, because I know the email will tell me who it's from, but make sure at the top of the Word document, you do also put your name and the date as well. Um, name being the most important one. You can write part one, part two. So make it as clear as you can. And uh, Danny Astri, I think in the fairness... 
of everybody else we'll have to leave your speaking test um because i think it's otherwise it would be a bit unfair if somebody lost 15 or 20 minutes to do the writing when they've already done the speaking so um that's why it's important to make sure you do come to every lesson even if you've got lots on okay but i do hear you speaking in class which is lucky so i'll be able to i can get a good idea of your speaking from that but it's a shame you've not been able to do the the actual test. Uh, teacher? Yep. Do you write both parts of the writing eg mock exam in one doc word doc? Yes, please. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Oh, I think the one I put in the chat box was different, actually. Let me find the correct one. Sorry about that. Mm, Yes. Uh, may, may I go to the toilet? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well done. I don't know why I'm saying well done, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are you all doing the one about the fashion industry? Yeah, good. Because the one I sent in the chat, I sent the wrong one, actually. Um, doesn't matter if, you, if, you're doing, if you've ended up doing the one I sent. Is anybody doing the different one? All right, I'm going to send one in the chat that says the correct version this time. Teacher, I have finished both essays and I've sent it in to the email address. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was quick, Chong. That was very quick because uh, you, you do get an hour and 20 minutes. I so you've been writing very happy. Before, before this. Oh, you'd already bit started it. Oh, yeah. well done, Tom. That's very good. Well done. Okay, so um, what you can do then, Chong. Hmm. So you could do some additional uh, revision then in that case. So on in our books, let me just, I'm just finding it. Hold on. We got to the end of uh, Unit 12, The Animal Kingdom. Let me just find it on here. Yeah, well done for, for being ahead of the game there, Chum. Very good. I will look forward to reading it. Um, so we'd, we'd got to the end of um, 12 here, and then there is a revision section. So you could start the, the vocabulary and grammar review here into your book, and we'll go through the answers for anybody who, did, who does that, uh, finishes that next week. Okay. So is that okay? Yes. Great. All right. Well done. Okay, a couple of minutes, just finish the bit you're doing and then we'll round off the lesson. So two or three minutes, well, we'll say three minutes and then we'll just have a two minute to finish. Okay, then finish the sentence you're writing and we'll stop there. And if you have finished it, you can submit it to the email address, that's fine. Um, if you haven't, then we've already taken about 40 minutes today. So spend another 40 minutes for homework, writing the rest of it, and then submit it to the email address that's in the chat box. Remember, it's very important that you do do that because I'm going to be giving you a grade for each section of uh, the mock, for the mock test. So I won't have anything to give you for writing. I'd have to say zero, which would be a big shame. So definitely make sure you submit that before the lesson um, next week, so that's the deadline. So by the time we start next week's lesson, I should be able to see everybody's writing um, sent through to that email address that I've given you. And so well done, because once you've done that, that's all of the test complete. So very well done for your hard work over the last two weeks. Um, uh, do you have any questions about the format or anything to do with the mock tests that we've done over the last couple of weeks? If you think of any questions, you can bring them to next week's session because we'll start with some feedback. I'm going to give some whole class feedback about the speaking test um, and we'll go over a few questions and things then. And, um, and then we'll, con we'll do a bit of revision and then we'll continue on to the next unit, unit 13. So you're doing very well. Well done. Um, so, yes, well done, everybody.
and I will see you again next week, Monday the 8th. Don't forget to do your writing and submit it to the email address. All right, lovely to see you all. Well done for working hard. I'll see you again next time. Have a nice week. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, teacher. All right, bye-bye.